Good morning and welcome to a special lecture on Indigenous Health History by Dr. Travis Hay, entitled The Legacy of Josias Fiddler, Resisting Healthcare Inequities on Reserve in Sandy Bay First Nation. This lecture and the series as a whole is primarily targeted for students in HIST 3590, Indigenous Health History, a course here at the University of Winnipeg and it's filmed in Studio 1L10 at the University of Winnipeg. The lecture is also open to the public via Zoom, and we welcome those who are joining us that way this morning. The lecture is open, however, the question and answer period is reserved for the class, and so we ask those who are joining us um, by Zoom to log off at that time. Travis Hay is a Canadian historian of settler colonialism and federal Indian policy. Born and raised in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Travis moved to Treaty 7 territory in 2021 to take up a position as an assistant professor in the Indigenous Studies program with the Department of Humanities at Mount Royal University. His first book is called Inventing the Thrifty Gene, the Science of Settler Colonialism. And in it, Hay brings an analysis of settler colonial science to the context of the Canadian federal government and Indigenous healthcare history. So I really appreciate you making the time to speak to us all this morning, Travis, and I'll turn it over to you now. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to do the uh, awkward Zoom professor thing and just share my slides. And if someone could let me know and confirm that it's visible, I'm audible, we can see me, hear me, as well as my slides. Looks, looks good. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so again, thank you so much uh, for having me to this class. It's a, it's a great opportunity for me. Um, in 1988, in January, uh, Chief Josias Fiddler of Sandy Lake First Nation led a hunger strike at the Sioux Lookout Indian Hospital. Joining him in this hunger strike were Peter Goodman, Alan Mikas, Peter Fiddler, and Luke Mamakisik. In about the next 25 minutes, my goal will be to explain, at least to the best of my ability, why this happened, and I'll be looking both backwards and forwards from this hunger strike in 1988, which I consider to be a very major moment in Canadian healthcare history. I'm going to include some archival records and a couple documents that I'll read from, but these, as always, paint an incomplete picture, and they tell less than half the story. Uh, I couldn't tell the story the way that I do if it weren't for the help and assistance of Terry Red Sky Fiddler, who is an Anishinaabe elder who is widely known and respected uh, all over Canada, but specifically between the areas of Thunder Bay and Winnipeg. Terry Red Sky Fiddler is Josias Fiddler's widow, um, and she is someone who helped me uh, write the book, which I'll be sharing some stories with you today. And I'm sorry that I didn't ask Terry to be here with us today. Uh, she's the busiest person I know. She's between uh, Pekanjikum First Nation right now, helping them grapple with uh, the outcomes of a horrific fire, as well as between Toronto doing healthcare conferences. Um, I've asked a lot from Terry, so I figured that I would uh, take this on today, but I do apologize that she isn't here uh, with me. She wrote the afterword uh, to my book uh, and also helped me write uh, some of the stories that I'll share today. The cover art for this book uh, was uh, done by the Anishinaabe artist uh, Black Williams, and it was published with the University of Manitoba Press. If most of the things I say you'll be able to find uh, in this book, um, but I did want to assign a specific article for your Indigenous Health History class today, um, and that article uh, was from your professor, um, and it was uh, This Last Frontier, Isolation and Aboriginal uh, Health. Now, this article was from 2005, which is somehow almost 20 years ago already, um, but it was a really formative article for me. It argued that, and I quote, a discourse on isolation served to sanctify those medical professionals who worked with Native and Inuit people. Notions of isolation influenced how Aboriginal bodies were depicted as primitive and susceptible. And this article also very meaningfully positioned biomedical science as a regulatory agent by which colonial regimes collected knowledge about subjects and through which subjects were disciplined. Now, inescapably, it's going to look like I'm pandering a little bit to your professor here since I've chosen their article, but in a very, very sincere way, I wanted to underscore what an amazing opportunity each of you have to be 
learning Indigenous health history from Mary Jane McCallum. I mean, I would be such a better historian today had I had that opportunity. And although it's going to come off like I'm pandering a little bit, I think it will come across as we proceed just how formative this specific article was and how it kind of gave me the tools I needed to do the kind of research that I wanted to do in this field. So with uh, no more throat clearing and drum rolling, I'll just launch into uh, the story as I see it here. Um, and it begins with uh, this individual. Um, this is the late Dr. Harry Bain. He is one of the most celebrated figures in the entire history of Canadian medicine. Among several prestigious awards, he was inducted into the Order of Canada for, and I'm quoting, his compassionate devotion to the health care of the Native people of Northern Ontario, end quote. Now, while I'm sure Dr. Harry Bain was a nice enough guy, and he does indeed deserve some praise for his medical career, don't get me wrong, in my book, he plays a major role in having opened up Anishinaabe communities in Northwestern Ontario as sites of medical training and scientific experimentation. And this is kind of where the story that I wanted to share today begins. Dr. Harry Bain started as a pediatrician at the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto in the early 1950s, and he was also a member of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Ten years into his job, Dr. Harry Bain, who described himself as a man of the bush, was tired of the hustle and bustle of big city life, and as a way to get away from the stresses of his job, which must have been considerable, he took a fishing trip to Northwestern Ontario, right on the border between Ontario and Manitoba uh, in the 1950s. And during this specific fishing trip, Dr. Harry Bain noticed the poverty of Indigenous communities, the lack of medical services that were available in the region, as well as the high rates of infectious diseases, especially amongst Indigenous children. And quite understandably, this bothered him. So he looked around Canada and more specifically throughout Ontario as a way to try and understand potential best practices for resolving this issue issue. Like many white men with graduate degrees, he wants to help, right? And this is something that he took to uh, around the 1960s. He starts looking towards other universities. For example, in 1962, Queen's University began what they termed the Tyendinaga Mohawk Reserve Project. Now, they started using the Tyendinaga Mohawk Reserve as a site of medical training for a few reasons. If you read through the annual reports of this particular medical school, uh, in the 1960s, they were complaining about two specific weaknesses um, that their uh, students experienced. One, uh, they didn't have much experience in the provision of health care to children. And two, they didn't have much experience in the medical school providing health care to people who were non-English speakers or from other cultures, what we might today call, you know, culturally appropriate forms of health care. So this project worked well enough, at least for Queen's University's medical school. And in 1965, they expanded this practice and started sending medical students uh, to Moose Factory and into Meshkegawak territory on the northeastern shores of uh, James Bay. And in these years, medical services uh, started to be marginally improved, at least to the extent that medical students in training uh, were now offering healthcare services uh, on reserve. I'm sorry, my cursor's failing me here for a moment. Go to the next slide. Um, so Dr. Harry Bain investigated what the medical services looked like in Northwestern Ontario around this time. And this is a map, a representation of what they looked like in 1962. It's difficult to see on the slide perhaps, but what we're looking at here is a kind of patchwork system in which uh, nursing stations on reserve would be using trains, planes, and automobiles to send people who required medical services out to the Sioux Lookout Indian Hospital. They termed it the Sioux Lookout Zone Hospital. Um, the Sioux Lookout in, uh, Indian Hospital was the built in 1949, 85 beds at the time of its construction. Uh, it was the 21st Indian Hospital that had been constructed in Canada. And this patchwork system of medical evacuation flights, railway lines, and winter ice roads was extremely precarious, uh, to say the least. Um, some of the most heartbreaking stories that Terry Red Sky Fiddler shares uh, in the book, as well as in some other work we've done together, has to do with the preventable losses of life 
that very reliably took place due to this lack of access to medical services. Or maybe a nurse who was very uh, new to the area might not want to call in an expensive medevac flight to had she not believed the severity of the patient's condition. And I won't go into some of the uh, pretty horrific and heartbreaking stories of preventable losses of life, um, but Sandy Lake was not unique in this sense. As you can see, many of these communities uh, all have stories of preventable deaths that took place due to the lack of medical services. Um, people would be, uh, if winter ice roads were available, there could be one route that could get you to the hospital in Sioux Lookout. If they weren't available, you might have to await for a medevac flight. And you can see here a picture of the Sandy Lake nursing station. Now, not only did community members and indigenous political leadership kind of decry the huge gaps in this system, which were very dangerous, but even the nurses who worked within this healthcare system spoke to its shortcomings. For an example, in 1968, one annual report quoted a nurse as saying, if we have to summarize what we did in 1968, we can only say that we survived. And from the point of view of improvement in medical care, 1968 can be termed a lost year because our medical staff was reduced from five at the start of the year to one by the end of 1968. Some of the nursing stations had to be closed because of shortage of nurses. There's a definite increase of tuberculosis among the Indians here. Let us hope that a better system of communication, such as a radio system, will be installed so that we can speak to all the nursing stations 24 hours a day. So as you can see, this very precarious patchwork system was so rife with gaps to the extent that even communication between nursing stations and the Indian hospital was severely compromised, so said the nurses in 1968. So looking at what Queen's University's medical school had done, Dr. Harry Bain in 1969 began the, Sioux, the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project. And it started sending its medical students as well as its nurses uh, for training up in Northwestern Ontario. Now, again, this did objectively improve access to medical services in the region, but it also opened up communities to a, di by definition, lesser form of health care than other Canadians were enjoying at this very formative moment in the history of Canadian health care, right? And so we also see within the auspices of this project a kind of pipeline that gets created between Southern medical schools who all also start to look to these Northern communities as places where they can start performing experiments that they had otherwise not been able to conduct. So, for example, this patchwork system also did not necessarily meaningfully improve health outcomes uh, within Sandy Lake First Nation. For example, in 1971, there was a very serious influenza epidemic, and you can see here on this slide some newspaper coverage uh, of this uh, story, which became slightly more timely during COVID. Uh, from uh, February of 1972, and I quote, an inquest starts Thursday into the deaths of one of three persons during an influenza epidemic that swept through this remote northwestern Ontario community earlier this winter. Central to the issue in the inquest is the adequacy of federal government health services available to the 1,500 Indians during the six-week epidemic. The Indians claim it took the Health and Welfare Department three weeks to get a doctor into Sandy Lake, despite two formal requests from the nine-member band council. By the time the first doctor arrived, three Indians had died, more than a thousand had the flu, and 28 were in serious enough condition to be taken to the hospital. So this was a bit of a scandal for the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project, as well as the Medical Services Branch of the Department of National Health and Welfare. And the response here is somewhat interesting to put it lightly. So how did the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project respond to these severe gaps in healthcare and this acute episode of a lack of services, particularly during the influenza epidemic of the early 1970s? Well, that story has to do with this man, Dr. Gary Goldthorpe, who Dr. Harry Bain sent to Sioux Lookout as a, the person who was managing the Sioux Lookout project. And I'll break here to quote from uh, Dr. McCallum's article here, as she said, like the jungles of deepest Africa to the Boy Scout, the snow-capped peaks of Mount Everest to the manly mountaineer, or the Wild West to the American pioneer, isolation was the imperial backdrop to the courageous, adventuresome medical professional whose character and determination was what prepared them for the tasks of conquest and colonization. <laughs> 
And so when Dr. Gary Goldthorpe was sent to Sioux Lookout to manage this specific project, it was kind of a big deal in some local newspapers, right? And you can see here a pretty acute manifestation of, I would, I would argue, the very thing that Dr. McCallum was talking about uh, in their article. You can see, if, if you can't see the caption below this picture, which appeared in a local newspaper, he came, he sawed, he built a cabin. Dr. Der Gary Goldthorpe and one of the essential tools of his labor. So I think this really shows in a direct way, right, how the process of, of the expansion of medical services and the expanding of the settler colonial state into the provincial and territorial norths was often done at the same time by the same people, right? Medical services played a major role in colonization. And I think we see a pretty visual representation here of Dr. Gary Goldthorpe with his chainsaw and his stethoscope being the tools of his trade, so to speak. So Dr. Gary Goldthorpe is tasked with responding to this specific crisis of a lack of healthcare services in Sandy Lake First Nation, but in what was termed the Sioux Lookout Zone as a whole. And that zone specifically we're looking at here of Northwestern Ontario, including many of these communities, some of which had access to medevac flights, others where one would have to take winter ice roads. So the response of the University of Toronto, um, I'll, I'll put it this way, here's a letter that Dr. Gary Goldthorpe sent to Dr. Harry Bain in 1973, and I'll quote from it. Dear Harry, enclosed is a copy of the research proposal by Dr. Brian Haynes that I had mentioned to you by phone. It involves the administering of two vitamin C tablets to school children in one of the Northern communities, probably Sandy Lake, over a 10 week period, probably next winter. Placebo tablets would be administered to a control group and the incidence of URIs or upper respiratory infections over the period monitored. I think it well thought out and feasible. I told Brian that it would require your approval as well as that of the principal and chief at Sandy Lake. So we can see here that the response to this epidemic was to have an experiment, a double blind experiment involving placebo pills and the issuing of vitamin C to see if this impacted the outcomes of upper respiratory infections in Sandy Lake First Nation. And because we're dealing here with very highly educated academics who have great resources, the proposal for this specific experiment was quite comprehensive. As you can see here on the slide, they even broke down the cost per penny of each placebo pill that would be given to children, presumably of Sandy Lake, as was proposed in this specific project. And if you look into this story more deeply, you'll notice that the individual who proposed this experiment was himself someone who enjoyed medical training under the auspices of the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project. He's traveled north to those communities, he's come back, and responding as a medical professional might during this time, this is the way in which it was said that we would first understand and then presumably address the poor out health outcomes in Sandy Lake First Nation. But it was under this larger framework that the members of the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project first came into contact uh, with the chief of Sandy Lake First Nation, a man whose English name was Jacob Fiddler. This is the father of Josias Fiddler, who would later lead that hunger strike in the Indian Hospital in 1988. So the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project staff uh, suggested that this specific experiment on vitamin C and respiratory infections could be carried out for about $10,000, okay? The response from Chief Fiddler, Chief Jacob Fiddler of Sandy Lake was as follows. As you are in a position and you are directly and indirectly responsible for the general good health of our people, may we suggest to you and your department, National Health and Welfare, a different proposal. A grant of $19,300 to initiate physical fitness in Sandy Lake Reserve as a pilot project of the Department of National Health and Welfare in cooperation with the Deer Lake Band Council. The properties of the requested grant can be found on Band Council resolution attached. We are hopeful for your careful consideration as we feel we can benefit from such a program. With this in mind, we conclude yours truly, Jacob Fiddler. Now, even in the colonial archive, Chief Fiddler presents himself to us as a man of supreme tact and intelligence. 
He is being very gracious in this letter, right? But if you read between the lines of what is being said, he's basically saying, no, you cannot come here and experiment on our children. And if you have the funds to send people up here to conduct this study, you should send double that amount, almost $20,000, to do something that will actually impact our wellness and benefit our community. And this proposal or counter offer from Chief Jacob Fiddler and the Sandy Lake Band Council in 1973, as I'm sure will probably surprise very few people in the audience, was not accepted and was actually kind of responded to, I would argue, rather rudely by Dr. Gary Goldthorpe the man with the chainsaw on the previous slide. His response, incidentally, I do not agree with the statement in your letter that government services took away the physical activity that was essential for fitness and general health. I would be interested to hear any support you have for the statement. However, I commend your proposal and will give you all assistance I can with it. Yours sincerely, Gary Goldthorpe. So the archival exchange between the chief of Sandy Lake and his council, as well as the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout project ends here. As I've been told, Chief Jacob Fiddler did not have a very high estimation of the folks who worked for this project, did not believe that his counter proposal was taken seriously and the assistance that was promised him in securing uh, improvements to general health as well as access to fitness equipment in Sandy Lake uh, were not followed through upon. So the response from Sandy Lake uh, was various and multiple. And though I focus in my book and in this talk mostly on the history of Chief Jacob Fiddler's son, Josias Fiddler and his hunger strike, uh, it would be a disservice to you in this talk if I did not mention the role of indigenous women and Anishinaabe women from Sandy Lake, who in 1980 created a kind of health collective committee that they titled Pamia Tiwin, which you're getting a translation from me through Terry Red Sky Fiddler. She translates as all of us uh, trying to be healthy together was be the closest kind of, you know, Anglophone translation, of this Anishinaabe Moan term. And so we also see here in the midst of the celebration of the Sandy Lake Five or the five men who conducted this uh, hunger strike in 1988. We also see a lot of organizational work and foundational moves being made by women from the community uh, who did various things. They actually traveled to Toronto uh, and gave uh, talks to nurses to try and help them better understand what to expect and how to uh, perform and discharge their duties in a good way uh, in Sandy Lake First Nation, as well as the Sioux Lookout Zone more, more broadly. But the main response that I focus on from Chief Jacob Fiddler when he was told by members of the University of the Sioux Lookout Project that, you know, we are not going to uh, uh, give you this uh, this funding for your own purposes. And actually, if you look through the archives, uh, the University of Toronto Sioux Lookout Project just started shopping this experiment on vitamin C around to different band councils, trying to find someone who would in fact do this. And this is a part of a broader story, right? Because when I first read these records, to me, it seemed like a kind of easy decision that I thought right away, obviously all of these chiefs should say no, right? But if you say no to this to this project, you're turning away $10,000 in healthcare capacity and funding. And although it's exploitative to do these double blind kind of studies on indigenous children, it's not as easy as just saying no, since you are probably not going to be well treated by these individuals thereafter. And to push away any kind of capacity is a very heavy decision for a chief to be making in the 1970s. So while it might seem, at least to me in the present day, of course they should have said no to this, right? This is a very difficult decision and one that weighed heavily heavily on the chief and council of Sandy Lake. So Jacob Fiddler's ultimate response was also to educate his son, Josias Fiddler, on how to navigate this complex world of broken treaties and broken promises, particularly within the context of healthcare. And this leads us to the year of 1988, when in January, on January 18th of that specific year, Josias Fiddler, as acting chief of the community, led a hunger strike in the Sioux Lookout Zone Hospital, the Indian Hospital, as many locals refer to it as. Uh, and the specific point here was to apply a lot of pressure uh, to the director of the medical services branch to get them to travel to northwestern Ontario and meet with members not only of Sandy Lake First Nation, but of Nishnabi Aski Nation, that kind of umbrella political organization which represents many, not all, but many of the uh, communities in North Western Ontario uh, First Nations Reserves. Their plan was to gain media attention, which as you can see from this newspaper coverage, they certainly did. And Josias Fiddler is the man you see standing in his iconic cowboy hat facing 
this uh, the flag of the Anishinaabe Aski Nation, which has that symbol of the bear uh, on it. And this this image of uh, Josiah Fiddler and his specifically his cowboy hat is is usually the image that is evoked when one says his name in the region, since he's uh, quite well remembered uh, and very uh, kind of distinctively iconically wearing uh, these cowboy hats, uh, which his wife purchased for him in Edmonton when she finally went to one of those stores in uh, in Western Canada where she found a George Strait cowboy hat, the specific kind. She bought like fifteen of them and he wore them for the rest of his life. Uh, and it's something that the family still has and cherishes to this day. So joining uh, Chief Josias Fiddler here uh, to, to say their names again, to put the respect on them that they deserve was Peter Goodman, Alan Mikas, Peter Fiddler, and Luke Mamakisik, who joined him in this uh, hunger strike which of course, as I'm sure many of you will know, is not an unprecedented uh, form of protest and a very consistent way in which Anishinaabe political leaders have used their own bodies as sites of protest in order to raise awareness uh, and to put pressure on the federal government uh, for a long list of reasons. Uh, among the gaps in the healthcare system and the worsening health outcomes, the uh, both the perception and the reality of being experimented upon by scientists from the South, uh, they were also very concerned with what they termed meaningless consultations, uh, which is something uh, that unfortunately is a huge pattern, not only in the history of Indigenous health services, but service provision across the provincial and territorial norts more broadly. The hunger strike was successful. Candidly, the medical services branch, they caved pretty quickly. They knew that they were outmaneuvered here uh, by the political acumen of these individuals. Later, standing before the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, Josiah Fiddler explained his actions, and I'll quote, During my years as chief, I had seen lots of suffering. I had seen a lot of our people die unnecessarily. After my time as chief, I decided to try and do something about the medical services and the hospital services. Unless you had seen the conditions of the hospitals and nursing stations, you simply wouldn't understand. Something had to be done. And uh, Chief Josiah Fiddler was also a man who uh, experienced a pretty severe injury to his hip as he attended the McIntosh Indian Residential School and did indeed himself spend time in an Indian hospital. Unfortunately, he is someone who knew firsthand and all too well, and more than I ever will, write the realities of Indian health services in Northwestern Ontario uh, in, in this time period. So the hunger strike, very successful. It had three main success. It had many successes, but I'll, I focus on three of them. Uh, first, it called into question the entire system of healthcare provision within Northwestern Ontario. It led to the creation of a healthcare panel, which created several recommendations, and it led to the creation later of the Minoyawan Health Center in Sioux Lookout, which now services many in northern Anishinaabe communities. Uh, Josias and his wife Terry Red Sky Fiddler contributed to the formation of the programming. The conference room at this hospital is, or not at this hospital, at this health center is named in Josiah Fiddler's honor and the actual architecture of the building and the way in which it embodies Anishinaabe notions of health and wellness and community uh, are something that the uh, Fiddler family also uh, can claim as being uh, having done the lion's share of health for that hospital. The hunger strike also spurred on the creation of First Nations health authorities. As the government tends to do, they held a big you know, meeting and panel and they came up with all these recommendations. The chiefs of Anishinaabe Nation accepted only one of these recommendations, which was the creation of health authorities. And in 1989, we have the founding of the Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority, which today continues to advocate for Anishinaabe patient care uh, across the region. But this hunger strike also put Sandy Lake in a better position to deal with scientists and medical researchers from Southern Ontario. It gave them some leverage and some stronger footing in negotiating medical research deals. And this in fact proved to be very timely indeed since it was not long before Canadian scientists went back to Sandy Lake with another proposition for another experiment and study, this time looking for the infamous and mythic thrifty gene. So a quick break here for uh, a bit of background. Um, the thrifty gene was a hypothesis about diabetes in indigenous bodies that was invented by the American geneticist James V. Neal in 1962. This hypothesis simply proposed that indigenous peoples lacked access 
to consistent caloric intake prior to colonization. Because of many of the racist anthropological myths that suggest indigenous people lacked complex food systems, uh, the, the idea of Neil here was that indigenous bodies were always starving, always lacking calories, and so that they evolved under a specific selection pressure to be very thrifty with their metabolism or to hang on to calories in a way that non-indigenous bodies do not. Once he came up with this theory, James V. Neal traveled through the rainforests of the Amazon in Brazil and Venezuela for much of the 1960s, collecting bone marrow, breast milk, dental casts, urine samples, fecal samples, and blood samples to try and find evidence for this thrifty gene hypothesis. And of course, because he was very wrong about the capacity of indigenous agriculture to provide sufficient caloric intake to many of these communities, there was nothing to find, but this did not stop him from searching uh, pretty intensely for a, for a whole decade trying to find it. It is for this reason in my book that I refer to him as a marrow thief. And if you can see in my little thing here, I, I'm borrowing from Sherry Day Malin's uh, science fiction masterpiece, The Marrow Thieves, which uh, you know I think you should all buy and read in triplicate if you haven't yet. Right? Uh, so James V. Neal searches for like 10 years trying to collect all these bio samples to vindicate the thrifty gene hypothesis. But of course, because it's based on racist constructions of indigenous food waste, he finds nothing and he kind of leaves this theory uh, to the wayside. But a Canadian epidemiologist and geneticist named Dr. Robert Hegeli was a very close reader of James V. Neal and someone who thought that given the right opportunities and circumstances, he would indeed be able to find a thrifty gene had he been given meaningful access to indigenous bodies in Northwestern Ontario. It was under this research project and this idea of trying to find the mythic thrifty gene that the band council and chief Sandy Lake were later approached for a massive, massively funded research project, right? And this is really the narrative of much indigenous health history within Canada, though northern communities very often lack access to things like affordable food, reliable shelter, clean water, right? education and medical services, they have never lacked access to very well-funded scientists who want to come to their communities to perform experiments that help build CVs, illustrious careers, and I would situate Dr. Robert Hegeli within a specific history. Now, to be fair to the man, like James V. Neal before him, after this larger study was conducted, uh, he eventually came out and changed his findings. Unfortunately, in 1999 in the city of London, Ontario, based on the study that was done in Sandy Lake, Lake, Dr. Robert Hegeli announced to the Canadian media that he had found a thrifty gene in this community. He later rolled back these findings, but this did not stop, you know, how scientific journalism works, right? Like this was on the front page newspapers across the world. Chinese news agencies were covering it. The British Medical Journal cover it. David Suzuki, for better or worse, and probably the worst, covered it in a special uh, on uh, the nature of things. And the discussion of Indigenous peoples having a gene that causes diabetes became uh, a something that was stated easily by both academics and healthcare practitioners. And although later in his life, Dr. Robert Hegeli rolled back his findings and stated in no uncertain terms that the thrifty gene did not have the evidence or the base behind it, this still this idea still shows up in clinical journals, in, uh, in the Canadian pediatric guidelines. And every time I give this talk, especially to medical students, I'm told usually somewhat controversially, oh, I just had a class where the professor said that this was true, right? So despite the fact that this has lost all scientific veracity and has been shown to have no basis in evidence, the thrifty gene theory continues to be expounded within Canada as if it were true. And to be, again, fair to the man, Dr. Robert Hegeli has been generous towards my critiques of his, of his career, um, has even came to a job talk that I've given one time and was also someone who, uh, uh, who very clearly rolled back his findings when it was done. But the interesting and the thing that I would underscore about this history is that under the auspices of this DNA deal, Sandy Lake, what did they do with the money? They started education programs for healthy eating in their communities. They purchased fitness equipment. They had infrastructure to create walking trails in their communities uh, and other fitness initiatives. Now, What's interesting here is that all the way back in the 1970s, when Jacob Fiddler was asking the Canadian government to actually fund things that meaningfully supported community wellness, it was not until the DNA deal of the mid-1990s that much of this capacity was brought to Sandy Lake, again, under the auspices of an arguably exploitative research project uh, that very much not only impacted Sandy Lake in a negative way by constructing their experience of diabetes as genetic, 
but it also is something that became a uh, keynote within the discussions of Aboriginal diabetes in Canada, which is a category that I critique and reject wholly in the book. I'm very aware that Indigenous peoples have diabetes and often at a rate higher than other Canadians, but the specific beef I have with the Aboriginal diabetes framing is that it discusses it as a separate biomedical and metabolic condition that is not related to, you know, the diabetes that other people experience. It pathologizes Indigenous bodies and genetics as the cause of a disease which is multifarious and has many connections. Genetics will always play a role in anyone's manifestation of a chronic illness, but the specific framing of Aboriginal diabetes as caused by a thrifty gene is really what I critique in this book and really why I consider rejecting Aboriginal diabetes as a viable framing to think about Indigenous health and wellness in Canada. Um, the book concludes, this is a picture of Minu Yawin's health center, which in front of the health center are the grandfather rocks of Josias Fiddler. And they kind of act as a sign, as other things do with the Minu Yawin Health Center, that those who are walking through its doors uh, are walking a path that Josias Fiddler uh, had tread before them, that he left signs for them, and that this larger negotiation of healthcare history within Sioux Lookout in Northwestern Ontario is a complex story. It's a lot of nuance, and there's not a lot of, you know, very easy conclusions to draw from this, since the DNA deal was good. It brought health capacity to Sandy Lake. But it was bad. It also caused the pathologizing of Indigenous bodies across Canada in terms of the Aboriginal diabetes framing. And so the complex and difficult way to end this story, I think, is to really just underscore the legacy of Josias Fiddler, the struggle that these communities have undergone in order to receive the same kind of health care that most Canadians take for granted. And I wish I could say that, you know, everything's all good now in Northwestern Ontario. This is hardly the case. The lack of uh, x-rays on reserve, the lack of uh, access for palliative care on reserve, which takes Indigenous community members away from their families, people who hold languages and stories and knowledges. They end up leaving the community, as it is often said in Northwestern Ontario, life begins and ends off reserve more often than not. And this is, you know, healthcare equity remains a huge issue within Canada. And though it's important to underscore, you know, the powerful legacy of Josias Fiddler, it would also be, you know, a disservice to the, to the lecture I'm giving now to say that the, the battle is over. The Fiddler family continues to create this fight. Uh, Terry Red Sky Fiddler is, uh, is now working for the Minoyawan Health Center and helping with traditional and cultural programming in this field. Uh, and this is something that I think really needs to be underscored and looked at upon in a much more rigorous way than it has in the past. And I think I'm getting close to my promised 25 to 30 minutes here. So thank you so much, everyone, for uh, sticking with me this far. I'm really excited to uh, comments, questions, criticisms, and to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much.